Amen. Thank you, Keith, for reading today. I think I might start putting together readings that just have lists of names and places. <laughs> just for fun. And then the sermon will have nothing to do with that. So, yes, it helps to read it beforehand. That always does help. And, and one of those things that one of my professors in seminary did tell me, for anybody that ever winds up reading, uh, if you don't know how to pronounce it, chances are nobody else knows how to pronounce it either. So just say it as best you can. It doesn't matter. Nobody's going to get it anyway. So um, The message today uh, is going to be a lot of a history lesson for us. This is going to be a real history lesson, not like that Titanic story I told a couple weeks ago. Uh, actual history. Today is Pentecost, uh, Christian Pentecost, I should say, and we'll discuss that a little bit more as we go on. This is considered to be the birthday of the church, the big overall church. So happy birthday, church. Anybody bring a cake? No? Is that a no? Okay. Maybe for Christmas we can have a happy birthday Jesus cake. So Pentecost is the Greek word for 50th. It's the Greek word for 50th, if you ever wondered why, what Pentecost means. So we today are seven weeks after Easter, and there are seven days in a week, so seven times seven is, of course... 49. Very good. If we include Easter as one of those days, today would be the 50th day of Easter. That's why Pentecost is celebrated today. There are other churches, other denominations, follow what is called a liturgical calendar. And that liturgical calendar has to do with different times of year. It has specific readings, which come from something called a lectionary. This, there's not going to be a test today. There's going to be a lot of these little things I talk about today, but don't worry, there's no test at the end of it. Um, but it has a lectionary, uh, things that are to be read and to, done, and to be done on Sundays and on different holy days. Uh, things that we're a little more familiar with, like Advent and Lent. These are things that come from that liturgical calendar. So in this calendar, today would be considered the last Sunday of the Easter season. Next Sunday would start the season after Pentecost. It's not just a clever name, right? Season after Pentecost, and that goes all the way up through Advent. Now, we don't follow the liturgical calendar, at least not strictly. We kind of have this loosey-goosey approach, which would be called low church. I don't even know if we would be classified as low church or not. Um, we put low emphasis on that idea of ritual. This is, an oppo this is opposed to the high church, which was a higher emphasis on that ritual. So if you have a background in the Methodist church, for example, or Lutheran or Anglican, Episcopalian, Catholic, Orthodox, they tend to be more high church, they'll follow that calendar a little bit more strictly. And like I said, none of this is on the test afterwards, so don't worry about it. We might be more familiar with a term uh, similar to that of Pentecost, which is Pentecostal or Pentecostalism. So Pentecostalism is a Christian denomination. It's one of the youngest denominations, actually, in Christianity today, having gotten its start in the late 19th century and really got rolling in the early 20th century out in Los Angeles. But Pentecostalism tends to have a greater focus on the Holy Spirit and specific emphasis on certain spiritual gifts. That's why it's called Pentecostalism, named after Pentecost, which was the coming of the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk about today. Some of the gifts that, that are focused on in Pentecostalism um, we might not be familiar with if we haven't seen it or heard it before. Um, there's a lot of more focus on he gifts of healing, gifts of tongues. Uh, I'm not going to say if that's right or that's wrong. It's just something that Pentecostals put a little bit more forefront in the worship. I want you to remember too, though, that my entire knowledge about Pentecostalism is the one service that I've been to in my life. I don't know a lot about Pentecostalism. At that one service I was at, nobody spoke in tongues. They had an invitation for healing, and I don't know if anyone was healed. But the only reason I really mention Pentecostalism this morning is because that denomination does derive its name from this part of Acts, and I felt it might uh, be helpful at least to mention it as some of you start thinking about and kind of making a connection between the denomination of Pentecostalism or Pentecost, uh, Pentecostal and our uh, day of Pentecost here in Acts. So I want to break down our story a little bit, uh, dig a little deeper into this today to help us understand what is happening around this really really incredible miracle that we have. So Acts 2.1 reads, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
The first thing I want us to look at is, who is the they of verse 1? Who are they? How many they's are there? Well, they are the disciples. They are the believers that are still gathered in Jerusalem. So this is all after Jesus has been crucified, Jesus has died, he has come back to life, he has ascended to heaven. The believers are told to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Advocate, for the coming of the Helper, for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And they are doing just as they've been told. While they're waiting, they have replaced Judas with Matthias to be part of the Twelve. And Acts 1.15 tells us the number of believers at this time was about 120. 120 believers. The they in Acts 2.1 is probably this whole group of 120 people. So we have 120 people, 120 believers in Jesus Christ that are all gathered in one place, and they are gathered for the day of Pentecost. They're gathering for Pentecost. So Pentecost does not start out as a Christian thing. There are Jewish roots for the holiday. The holiday that's being celebrated is called the Festival of Weeks. It's also known as Shavuot. I don't speak Hebrew. I maybe said that a little bit wrong, but I think that's fairly close. Shavuot, or the Festival of Weeks. This is one of the big Jewish festivals. This is one of the big holy days for Jewish people. And remember, the followers of Jesus at this time are still considered Jewish. Jewish. Jesus came as the Messiah. He came as the, the Jewish Messiah. He came as the Gentile Messiah as well. But his first followers were all Hebrew. They were all Jewish. So the believers, the believers in Jesus at this point, are together celebrating this festival of weeks, which is also called Pentecost. Why is this Jewish festival called Pentecost? Well, for that answer, we really have to dive a little deep. So if you want to tune me out for the next few minutes, feel free. I'll tell you when you can come back, all right? So chronologically, we're thinking of a timeline now. Chronologically, the last books of the Old Testament were written about 400 years before the birth of Jesus. So 400 BCE, 400 BC, however you want to refer to the time frame. In the time between the last writings of the Old Testament, or the last writings of the Hebrew Bible, and the time of Christ, there was a real threat at that point that the Hebrew language was going to be lost. And if the language was lost, the language of the Hebrew Bible, the language of the Law and the Prophets, what we call today the Old Testament, would also be lost. We would have lost the Hebrew Bible. We would have lost the scriptures because the language died. A couple hundred years before Jesus, a translation was started to translate the Hebrew Bible from the Hebrew into the common language at the time, which was Greek. And the legend has it that this work was given to 70 different people to complete, and those 70 people working independently, as legend has it, all came up with exactly the same translation. This translation came to be known as the translation of the 70, or the Septuagint. Septuagint is the Greek word for 70. Well, fortunately for us, Hebrew was not lost, meaning translations that we have today can use Hebrew manuscripts, they can use Greek manuscripts to bring us God's word in English as it gets translated to English for us. Now, as you read through your Bible, you might see a footnote, uh, and if you have your Bible, you might have a footnote actually going with this chapter, um, uh, with chapter 2, verse 28. But the footnote may say something about Septuagint, on it. It might also say LXX, which is a Roman numeral for 70, and that refers to this translation of the 70, or the Septuagint. So like I said, in, in chapter 2, verse 28, we have this note, and this is Peter addressing the crowd, and Peter quotes from Psalm 16 here. But if you read Peter's quote from Psalm 16, and you go back to Psalm 16 in the Old Testament, they sound a little different. Why is that? Well, my note also says Septuagint on it. In the first century, people were more familiar with the Greek translation than the Hebrew. So that's what they would tend to quote from. Consider translating from the Hebrew to English, or the Greek to English, or the Hebrew to the Greek to the English. There's a few extra steps in there, so they're going to sound a little different to us. Okay, That accounts for some of those differences. It doesn't mean that one's right and one's wrong. It just means that there's some, some translation differences in there. 
So what does this all have to do with Pentecost? Get to the point, Pastor Mike. I'm trying to. I'm getting there. We're celebrating the Festival of Weeks. The festival takes place 50 days after Passover. Since the Hebrew was translated into the Greek, and Pentecost is the Greek word for 50th, this Jewish Festival of Weeks also came to be known as Pentecost. All right, if you tuned out, you can pay attention again. So we probably have about 120 Jewish Christ followers in Jerusalem celebrating Pentecost. Acts 2, verses 2 and 3 say this. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Who wrote the book of Acts? Anybody know? Luke, yes. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Anybody know the other book that Luke wrote in the New Testament? It's not a trick question. It's Luke, yeah. It's, it's a pretty easy one, I think. But what Luke is doing at this point in Acts is he's getting information from other people to compile these accounts. And as, as a little side note, it's really interesting. There's a really neat part in, Luke, in, or in Acts 20 where Luke changes the way he's writing. And it goes from a lot of they, them, and he words to we, us, and I. And what happens at that point in Acts 20 is, of course, Luke is now with Paul at that point, And he's writing, he's no longer writing from uh, other people's accounts. He's writing from his own first-person account. It's just a really neat little thing that happens um, a little bit later in Acts. But we're not there yet. So here in this description of the coming of the Holy Spirit... Luke is trying to describe something absolutely miraculous. He's trying to describe something that people can't explain, something that is impossible to adequately describe, something no one has ever experienced before. He says a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. He says what seemed to be tongues of fire. It doesn't mean that there was a violent wind blowing. It just sounded like there was. It doesn't mean there were tongues of fire, but there was something there that looked like this. This is the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit, coming to these believers. This is a very new experience. Imagine, if you will, trying to describe the aurora borealis, the northern lights. A lot of us got to see those this last week. Very, fairly vivid in some areas. I hope you were able to at least catch a glimpse of that. But if you've never seen that before, and you never had, and you had no idea what this was. You never even heard of it before. You see this incredible thing up in the sky, these vivid colors of purple and green and pink and red and white, and they're dancing around. How do you describe that to someone that has never seen it before? And how do you describe it when you don't know what you're looking at either? Well, this sound and this this thing that looks like tongues of fire, this is how God is making his presence known. There's a sound like a blowing wind. There is something jumping from person to person that looks like tongues of fire. After these Christ followers are filled with the Holy Spirit, what do they start to do? Does anybody remember what they start to do? Start to speak in tongues, yes. Start to speak in tongues, they start to speak in different languages. Now there's a lot of debate today about the speaking in tongues miracle, about the spiritual gift. Does it still happen today? How does it manifest as a miracle today? Uh, and I'm not going to discuss that today. We're going to have a spiritual gifts day here in a few weeks. And I'll, I'll certainly touch on that a little bit in a few weeks. But what's likely happening here in Acts is the Christ followers all begin to speak in different languages. They all speak in languages that they never would have spoken before. And it's likely that because we get a list of nationalities from those people staying in Jerusalem. <laughs> people... We have people literally from all over the known world that are present and they're hearing in their native tongue the good news of Christ Jesus. 
And they're hearing it from people that shouldn't be able to speak that language. Look at verse 7. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How do they know the people are from Galilee? Well, how can we tell if someone is from New York or Texas or North Dakota? You can tell by their speech pattern, right? I was going to do a really bad New York and Texas accent here. I'm going to forego that. I got my North Dakota accent the way it is, so... Knowing this goes out on the internet, you know, my, my Texas accent, talking about Whataburger or something like that probably would... Anyway. But what's really interesting is the people are here... The people that are here celebrating this festival of weeks, celebrating Pentecost, are, are not so much visiting from all these places. They are very likely have, have lived in those places, and they have now moved back to Jerusalem. The, the word here really refers to someone that's living or dwelling in Jerusalem, not simply visiting. So for people that are living in Jerusalem, they likely are already going to speak the common language uh, of Jerusalem, which at this time is going to be Aramaic. But they would still retain the language from their home country. If one of us moved to Mexico City or Barcelona, we would learn some Spanish, but we wouldn't forget the English that we know either, correct? So these people are all there. They're hearing a bunch of Galileans speaking in many different languages, telling them, about this Messiah that has come to save the world. The Jesus followers could have spoken in Aramaic, and those around them would have understood the message. In fact, when Peter speaks here in just a little bit, uh, he's likely back to speaking in that Aramaic. But there's the miracle of the Holy Spirit that occurs. 120 people speaking in languages they don't know, telling other people about Jesus Christ. Many of the people that hear this are curious and they listen a little more closely because they aren't expecting to, anyone hear, to hear anyone speaking their native language. But there's so many others that they're not really so impressed. Verse 13 says, Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. Peter says that in, in verse 15. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. Nobody's drunk. Settle down. It's too early. You know, I think a lot of the time we like to think that when Jesus comes back, when he descends from the clouds and he makes himself known again, he reveals himself once again, so many people around the world are going to just be in shock and they're going to look at Jesus and they're going to go, wow, I was wrong. I made a mistake. I really wish I would have listened to all of these Christians who have been telling me about this. But I don't think that's what's going to happen. Because we look at Acts here, you have all of these people who are witnessing this incredible miracle, and how many of them are rejecting it? Saying, oh, those people are they're just drunk. They're crazy. Jesus is going to come back, and half the world is probably going to say, well, there's got to be some rational explanation for all this. Do we really think everyone is going to figure it out like that? Unfortunately, no, I don't think they are. On this day, this day of Pentecost, we have thousands of people witnessing this incredible miracle. Many of them listened to the Holy Spirit speaking through the Christ followers and then later listened to Peter and they're saved. We're told that 3,000 were saved that day. We go from 120 to 3,000 in a day. But there are so many others that don't listen. They see the miracle, but they dismiss it as foolishness or drunkenness. They reject what the Holy Spirit is doing, this visible and audible miracle. But they say, no, I don't believe. But those willing to listen, they then hear Peter say this to them. Peter says, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man credited, accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. 
This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. I know many of you here today already believe in this Jesus that rose from the dead. This Lord and Messiah. But some of you may not yet believe. You can make today that day. Peter said it beautifully, what Jesus did, how God foretold what was going to happen, and what we need to do to be saved. Repent. Repent and be baptized. Repentance is recognizing there is sin in your life, sin that keeps us separate from God. To repent is to admit that sin and to turn from it, and to turn to God and accept the gift of life that is in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Turn to Him. Turn to Him and say you want to start living for Jesus now. I'm going to invite our praise team to start heading back forward for our final song. But if you have heard this message today, if you have been stirred in your heart by the Holy Spirit, if you have come to know that Jesus is Lord, and if you want to accept Jesus as your Savior today, I encourage you, please come forward as our final song is played and pray with me or pray with, with one of our elders in the back. Today is the day the church started, the day the Holy Spirit came. And today's the day that you too can receive the Holy Spirit if you just believe in Jesus as your Savior. Let's pray. Wonderful God, we thank you for this day. And God, for anyone that hasn't known you until now, God, I pray for them that they would say Jesus is Lord. They would call to you, recognize that yes, you, Lord Jesus, are truly the Messiah. That they believe that you died that you came back to life in physical form. You came back. God, for anyone that's struggling with that, for anyone that doesn't quite understand that, God, I pray that you speak to them now and show them the, the truth of, of what you have done for us. And God, for anyone here today, whether they're a believer or not, whatever they're going through in their life today, (coughs) if they're struggling with something, I encourage them to turn that over to you so that you can respond. 
that you can be present, that you can show them your goodness and your love. Let us all come together as we sing this final song to praise you, to pray to you, to hear your voice one more time. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.